In this video lecture, we're going to discuss insurance regulation, which is from Chapter 2, or Assignment 2, of the CPCU 520 text. We'll discuss the history of insurance regulation, reasons for insurance regulation, the role of different bodies of government in insurance regulation, regulatory activities, and unofficial regulators. So let's start with a look at the history of insurance regulation. To truly understand insurance regulation, you need to look back at history and how today's regulatory activities and participants came about. First, let's discuss Paul versus Virginia, and this is review from the risk and insurance class. Samuel Paul was an insurance agent operating in the state of Virginia, but Samuel Paul was licensed in New York and selling from a New York insurance company. Virginia said that Paul should obtain a license to sell in Virginia and only sell from a Virginia company. Paul argued that insurance should operate across state lines and was interstate commerce and therefore he should not have to purchase this license in Virginia or sell from a Virginia company. The U.S. Supreme Court disagreed with Paul's argument, which meant that Paul had to secure a license in Virginia. But more importantly, it established the precedent in 1869 that insurance was not interstate commerce, but instead a personal contract between two people, and therefore that it should be regulated by state governments and not the federal government. So, for 75 years, insurance was regulated by the states, until the U.S. versus SEUA, again another United States Supreme Court case, which ultimately addressed the issue of insurance regulation. SEUA was the Southeastern Underwriters Association, similar to today's ISO, or Insurance Services Office. SEUA's members were insurance companies, for whom SEUA developed policy forms and rates. The U.S. Attorney General accused SEUA of engaging in monopolistic pricing because it collected data from all of its members and then developed and made available rates based on all of that data. SEUA didn't argue that they weren't engaging in monopolistic pricing, but they did say that because monopolistic pricing laws were federal laws, that is the Sherman and Clayton Acts, and because Paul versus Virginia established that they should be state regulated, they were not subject to those federal laws. However, the U.S. Supreme Court essentially overturned Paul versus Virginia, saying that today insurance is interstate commerce and therefore should be regulated by the federal government. So this established a precedence for insurance regulation at the federal and not state level. But this created a lot of problems for the insurance industry, who quickly came to the table to argue that they should be state regulated, as they had been for the last 75 years or more. A year after U.S. versus SEUA came a congressional act called McCarran-Ferguson, also known as Public Law 15. Notice that it only took one year for Congress to come forth with an act which reasserted the right of the federal government to regulate insurance, but it stated that the federal government will generally not get involved in the insurance business as long as the states are doing an adequate job of regulating insurance, despite the fact that it is considered interstate commerce. Many times over the course of this semester and the surplus lines and reinsurance class, I'll mention the fact that the threat of a repeal of McCarran-Ferguson dictates many of the behaviors of insurance companies today. Nearly all states quickly passed rating laws after McCarran-Ferguson was passed. The rating laws stated rates must be adequate, not excessive, and not unfairly discriminatory. We'll discuss these once we get to rate making in our discussions of regulatory activities. So now that we've established how insurance regulation got to where it is today, let's talk about reasons for insurance regulation. First, we'll talk about the principal goal, which is consumer protection, and then maintaining solvency, which supports consumer protection, and preventing destructive competition. Starting with consumer protection. In order to protect consumers, regulators monitor and protect against misrepresentations, 
which are an agent or other company representative, such as an underwriter, a claims adjuster, or anyone on staff, telling an insured or prospective insured the wrong thing. This would lead to an errors and omissions claim against the insurance representative. Because insurance is based on a rather complicated contract and because risk is being transferred from the insured to the insurance company and by nature is risky, it's important that the representations or statements made by the insurance company are valid and verified and monitored by regulators and that when an insurance company representative lies or misrepresents their company that the insured has somewhere to go to make a complaint against that insurance company and that the regulator takes action against the insurer for its wrongful representations. Next, bad faith claims. When an insurance company either denies or delays payment of a legitimate insurance claim, again, regulators will take action against the insurance company. Then, misuse of funds. Remember, of course, that an insurance company has a fiduciary duty to its insureds. A fiduciary duty is basically a financial responsibility to take care of the premium dollars paid to them because of their contractual obligation to pay claims. Always remember that an insurance policy requires the payment of premium up front and that it is incredibly important and incumbent upon an insurance company to wisely invest and protect those funds. Last, mismanagement or management caused insolvencies are monitored by the insurance department. While the insurance business may not be rocket science, it is a complicated business requiring underwriting, claims, and actuarial expertise, as well as appropriate management of funds and personnel. When an insurance company mismanages insurance contracts, it could result in insolvency and the inability to pay claims. Always remember, too, that an insurance company's obligation to pay claims when policyholders have had some of the worst things happen to them is an incredibly important responsibility that must be protected and monitored. Another reason for regulation is to maintain solvency, which of course supports protection of the consumer. This is the requirement that an insurance company can continue to meet its liabilities, which are legitimate claims for insurance coverage. Remember we discussed the reasons for insolvency, especially the deficient loss reserves and inadequate pricing as a cause of loss. This is the fact that insurance companies have to set aside money to pay for losses for accidents that have occurred, but the loss has not been reported yet. And essentially, an insurance company must make their best guess at how much they need to set aside for those losses. That, along with overly rapid growth, fraud, catastrophe losses, impairment of an affiliate, investment problems, significant changes in business and reinsurance failure, are all aspects of insurance operations that an insurance department must monitor. Now let's look at some of the insolvency prevention actions an insurance department takes when there's a risk that one of the companies it regulates might be insolvent. We'll start with the less extreme risks, and we'll look first at the least extreme down to the more extreme, and then we'll look at the most extreme action an insurance department can take. First is to just restrict writings. If a department of insurance sees that an insurance company is having problems in a particular area, maybe a particular territory or line of business, they might restrict their writings in that area or just for that line of business but not do anything about their other territories or lines. If the problem isn't resolved, they might demand a new business plan, which would require them to submit new plans with respect to underwriting, rating, possibly marketing, and claims for the company. And the next extreme would be to issue cease and desist orders, where the insurance department actually requires the insurer to completely stop writing in a line of business or territory, or possibly overall. Next, the department could initiate informal department supervision, or receivership, where the insurance company essentially maintains its staff but the Department of Insurance comes in and becomes the supervisor to all of their operations. The issue cease and desist orders and initiate informal department supervision can be interchangeable in terms of their extremes, and a department might do either or both. 
The most extreme action an insurance department can take is to begin legal proceedings to establish a conservatorship, which involves for the insurance company to reorganize it, possibly rehabilitate it, or overall liquidate it. A conservatorship may result in the company being completely reorganized under a new business plan, rehabilitated possibly by interjecting capital, or being bought by another parent company, or totally liquidating the insurer. When an insurance company is liquidated, there are still operations that need to continue. Remember that an insurance company might still have claims coming in many years after policies have been in force. So even a liquidated company has what's called runoff policies, or policies that were in force in a prior period and still have claims that were covered and must be paid. The last goal of a Department of Insurance is to prevent destructive competition. Ask yourself, why is the insurance industry more at risk for destructive competition than most industries? It's difficult to evaluate the product that you're purchasing with insurance. In most cases, you're purchasing nothing more than a promise to pay. It is a future action that is contingent upon a legally binding contract. And even the most sophisticated of an insurance consumer would have a difficult time evaluating one insurance policy to another. But even more importantly, insurance companies can undercut prices by issuing a policy and not have to pay up until sometimes years later. There's a bad industry practice called cash flow underwriting, where an insurance company charges premiums that they might know to be inadequate but knows that they won't have to pay claims until down the road. This is a bigger problem in liability insurance where lost tails or the time from the accident to the actual payment of the claim can be very long. So because an insurance company can undercut prices up front, they can engage in destructive competition and ultimately not be solvent enough to pay for losses when they actually occur. Now let's discuss the role of different bodies of government in regulating insurance. We'll start with the legislative branch, then we'll discuss the judicial branch, and then we'll discuss the role of the executive branch in regulating insurance. The role of state legislatures includes passing insurance industry regulatory laws, for example, producer and claims licensing laws, that is, the laws regulating all aspects of producer and claims licensing in order for someone to do business in that state. Not every state requires claims licenses. The state of Louisiana actually does. Also, capital requirements. The amount of money that an insurer has to put up before they can operate and as they continue to operate. We'll look at those in a moment. And rules on insurance requirements that affect operations such as in workers' compensation. Workers' compensation laws are very specific in terms of how an insurance company provides workers' compensation, not only the benefits, but many other aspects of the coverage. Also, state legislatures set insurance department budgets. Being able to set the department budget has a significant impact on how an insurance department operates. Also, there is what's called the National Conference of Insurance Legislators, somewhat similar to the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, which you heard me speak about in Principles of Risk and in Insurance, develops model laws to promote consistency and uniformity among states. Again, the NAIC is a similar body for insurance department commissioners, so we'll talk about them in a moment. Now let's look at the judicial branch. The judicial branch basically has three distinct roles in regulating the business of insurance. First, courts and judges may be called upon to interpret insurance contracts. As you know, the insurance policy is a legal contract and sometimes can be very complicated and ambiguous. Any ambiguity must be interpreted in favor of the insured in most cases, so it is incumbent upon the courts to make those decisions sometimes. Also, the judiciary has to interpret the laws and how to follow those laws as set by the state legislatures. And finally, the judiciary often gets involved in resolving disputes between policyholders and insurance companies and disputes between insurance companies and claimants in a dispute involving liability insurance. Next, the executive branch. These are state departments and commissioners who enforce the laws against insurance companies and other insurance entities. The National Association of Insurance Commissioners, which I mentioned previously, 
fosters coordination between the states. Much like NCOIL for insurance legislators, the NAIC recommends model laws and promotes unity. They meet three times per year. But keep in mind that they have no legal authority to enforce any laws. Nothing that the NAIC does is legally binding unless the individual state department adopts the NAIC model law or rule. So, let's look at the responsibilities of state insurance departments and state insurance commissioners. State insurance departments, who do work for and under state insurance commissioners, are responsible for licensing insurers, licensing producers, claims representatives, and sometimes others, approving policy forms, holding rate hearings and reviewing rate filings, evaluating solvency information about an insurance company, performing market conduct exams, issuing cease and desist orders when necessary, investigating policyholder complaints, rehabilitating or liquidating insolvent insurers, fining insurers that violate state law, publishing shopper's guides and other consumer information, and conducting financial and market examinations of insurers. These occur on site every three to five years for an insurer that is domiciled in the state. State insurance commissioners oversee the department's operations, promulgate orders, rules, and regulations necessary to administer insurance laws, hold hearings on insurance issues when necessary, take action when insurance laws are violated, issue an annual report on the status of the state's insurance market and the insurance department, and in some cases, oversee state's government residual insurers. This is all from page 2.6. The state insurance commissioner is the face of the insurance department, and this can be a very public and important state government role. In the state of Louisiana, the insurance commissioner is elected. You can see here in this map that most states appoint their insurance commissioners. In those states, the insurance commissioner is appointed by the governor of the state or in some cases by a commission. As you can see from this map, there are only 10 states currently where the insurance commissioner is elected. I wanted to show you an excerpt from this Excel spreadsheet. This was something that I created as part of some consulting work that I've done for the Louisiana Department of Insurance looking at insurance premium taxes. Louisiana has one of the highest insurance premium tax rates in the country. But the reason that I wanted to show you this excerpt is to point out two things. One, that there are numerous ways that insurance companies are charged to do business in the state. Here you see a filing fee, and in most states there's what's known as a certificate of annual renewal, and often insurance companies have to pay different taxes like the fire tax, a fraud tax, and in some cases, a municipal fee. In the state of Louisiana, a $1,000 annual filing fee is required. A fire tax of 3.5% against fire insurers. A small fraud tax is charged. And though this is difficult to see, there are charges for municipalities that range approximately between half a percent and 4%. Also, Louisiana's tax rate for property insurers is 3%, which you can see is higher than most other states. 3% is actually on revenue, not net income. So while that percentage may seem low compared to other types of tax, it is not an income tax. It is a revenue tax. Insurance companies don't get to expense out all of their various expenses in order to calculate their tax liability. The second point here is that these rates and fees vary greatly from state to state. Now let's take a closer look at regulatory activities that are conducted by the states. We'll start with a look at capital requirements, then licensing requirements, rate regulation, monitoring market conduct, and contract language. Insurance companies are required to carry a certain amount of capital when they first start and as they continue operations. These requirements vary greatly from state to state. Most commonly, states require a million dollars in capital and a million dollars in surplus. For mutual companies, they only are required to carry surplus since they do not have capital provided by shareholders. But the requirements can be as low as 150000 in one state, and in another state, it's as high as $5 million. Capital requirements also vary within states. 
by initial versus ongoing, meaning the amount of capital they must carry when they first begin operations as an insurance company and how much they have to carry when they've been in business three, five, or more years. And capital requirements vary in most states based on the line of business. For example, the requirements might vary based on whether they're life, health, workers' comp, property and casualty, or an HMO. Finally, capital requirements can vary depending on how the insurance company is organized, whether as a stock, mutual, or reciprocal company. As I mentioned before, only stock companies have capital requirements, whereas mutual, reciprocal, and stock companies all have surplus requirements. Let's look at an example of Louisiana's capital requirements. Notice the different lines of business listed here in Louisiana's capital requirements. However, you'll also note that in terms of paid-in capital, there are only three different capital requirements. In terms of the minimum surplus requirements, which is assets minus liabilities, these again do vary and are higher than paid-in capital requirements. Operating surplus is a bit lower and is the same with all lines of business with the exception of title insurance. Operating surplus is basically the surplus that is generated from operations. Now notice that there are different requirements for mutual companies. As I said, there are no paid-in capital requirements, but there are minimum surplus requirements, which are very similar, which are very similar to those for stock companies. The NAIC on their website provides a list of all minimum capital and surplus requirements if you ever need to know. Now let's discuss licensing requirements. First for insurers and then for personnel. In order to be licensed, first insurers must meet their capital and surplus requirements. And as I already said, only surplus and not capital requirements for mutuals and reciprocals. In terms of licensing, an insurer can be admitted to some states and non admitted to others. In order to be admitted in a state, an insurance company must jump through many more steps and is subject to all the types of regulation that we're going to discuss today, such as rate regulation, contract regulation, and market conduct, whereas non-admitted insurers are not as closely regulated. Insurers can also be admitted in just some lines and non-admitted in others. For example, an insurer can be admitted in a state in commercial property but operate on a non-admitted basis in Inland Marine. For personnel, agents must be licensed in the state of the policyholder and generally must complete continuing education requirements every year. The National Insurance Producer Registry, or NIPR, helped create more uniformity in licensing requirements. Claims adjusters need to be licensed in some states, including Louisiana. Now let's talk about insurance company rate regulation. Insurance rate regulation can be anywhere from prior approval to open competition. From the Insurance Information Institute, here are some examples of different states' rate regulation. And this chart basically lists all the different forms of rate regulation. Let's quickly discuss some of the more common forms of rate regulation, starting with prior approval. Under prior approval rate regulation systems, the state must approve a rate before the rate change is issued to an insurance company's policyholders. Flex rating generally means that the insurance department doesn't have to prior approve rate changes within a certain band. File in use means that the insurance company files a rate change but can go ahead and use the rate change once the change has been filed. Use and file just means that the insurance company can begin to change the rates but still has a certain period of time to file those rate changes. No file record maintenance, sometimes known as open competition, means that the insurer doesn't have to file rates with the Department of Insurance, but they must maintain a record of rate changes so that upon the request of the Department of Insurance, they can provide actuarial justification for any rate changes. Keep in mind that even when rate regulation is open competition, this doesn't mean that rates aren't regulated, as in non-admitted markets. In the admitted markets, the state insurance department always has the ability to deny rate changes, even in an open competition state. If the department determines that the rate change was too high and is not actuarially justified, 
they can require an insurer in an open competition state to refund issued rate changes. Notice that in Louisiana, rate regulation is file in use for all lines today. In the state of Louisiana, you file the rate deviation, and those deviations will go into effect in 45 days unless the department objects to the change. So essentially, the department has 45 days to review the changes and decide whether they want to disapprove of those changes. It's also important to note that insurance rating agencies file rates on behalf of members. The largest is Verisk ISO, which you might know as the Insurance Services Office, which was not long ago purchased by Verisk Analytics. Members can just adopt rating organization changes or they can file deviations from those changes. Not all insurance companies are members of ISO. In particular, the larger companies tend to not use the ISO rate changes. Now let's discuss the goal of rate regulation. And we've discussed this before when we and I've discussed this before when we first talked about the history of insurance regulation in this lecture. I said that after McCarran-Ferguson, all states adopted laws that said rates must be not excessive, adequate, and not unfairly discriminatory. Let's look a little more closely at each of these. Insurance rates should be not excessive. This is especially a concern because of the fear of monopolistic pricing. The idea being that since insurance rates are difficult to evaluate, and since in some lines of business there might not be enough competition in insurance, that the insurance players might overprice their insurance and make excessive profits. And again, because rates are difficult to evaluate, it's uncommon for individual insureds or even commercial insureds to be able to make this determination. But regulators can make this determination using their actuarial expertise. And as part of this, they should consider the number of insurers. This will help them know whether or not the market is competitive, the relative market share of each insurer. If an insurer has a market share of, say, 70%, there might be a form of monopolistic pricing and regulators should watch out for excessive prices. Even a market share as much as 35% should be a concern of regulators. And regulators should consider the degree of rate variation from one insurance company to another. If there's a significant variation, either one insurer is not operating very efficiently or could be overpricing their product. Of course, it's also possible that one insurer's rates are not adequate. Regulators should, of course, consider past and prospective loss experience. It is that loss experience which will help to actuarially justify an insurer's rates. Then there's the cat load. Catastrophes include things such as hurricanes, wildfires, and in the case of NFIP and some excess insurers, floods. Insurers should charge a catastrophe load each year, although most years there won't be a catastrophe. Additionally, there should be an appropriate profit contingency margin. A rate which is too high might have too high of a profit margin. And there should be a marketing load. As you can see, the term load is significant. A load is a charge for expenses that aren't directly related to the loss. And finally, judgment factors, which vary by line. Judgment factors are factors that suggest how much a loss might be that can't necessarily be justified by actuarial experience. Next, let's look at what regulators should consider in terms of rate adequacy. Regulators should consider and be concerned about unknown losses. The intensity of competition, as I mentioned with excessive rate regulation. If one insurer has too high a market share, rates could be excessive. But if competition is extremely intense, insurance companies will tend to price their products lower. So truly intense competition while it might be a sign of a healthy marketplace, might also indicate rates could be inadequate. Also, public policy issues. One area of public policy that might be of concern for regulators is the use of recreational and medical marijuana. The liability associated with this exposure can vary based on public policy and other state laws. And last, catastrophes and other unanticipated events. Regulators must allow for that cat load, making sure that pricing is adequate in the event there is a loss such as a wildfire or hurricane or other catastrophic or unanticipated loss. 
And last, rates must be not unfairly discriminatory. This is a complicated issue that requires regulators to consider are insureds representative of the sample? Are rating factors appropriately reflective of risk factors? And in general, are rating factors appropriate? You must remember that rates do discriminate. That is the nature of rating, and that they should discriminate only based on appropriate risk factors. But when it comes to the idea of not unfairly discriminatory, there are certain factors such as race, religion, and ethnic background that insurance companies cannot use to price their product. But rate discrimination is important because it helps to reduce adverse selection, it makes rates more fair, and in some cases it discourages risky behavior and encourages loss prevention. If you are a non-smoker, you wouldn't want to pay the same rates for life insurance or health care as someone who chooses to smoke. Now let's look at how insurance departments monitor market conduct. One of the most significant ways for enforcing market conduct rules are fines or suspension. For more minor offenses, the insurance company or agent will be fined, but for ongoing or more significant offenses, they actually may be suspended from operations by pulling their license to operate or to sell insurance, respectively. So first, producer practices. Insurance departments look for dishonesty or fraud, misrepresentations, when an insurance broker or agent lies to a policyholder or potential policyholder, usually in order to secure the sale, which is encouraging an existing policyholder to change companies, which results in higher new commissions since renewal commissions tend to be lower, unfair discrimination, for example, refusing to work with a prospective policyholder simply because of something that is a protected class, like ethnic background, religion, race, or sexual preference, rebating, which is returning a portion of your commission in order to lower the price. Insurance departments also regulate claims practices, especially in the areas of bad faith claims, primarily where the insurance company delays claims payment or undercuts the claim amount or denies a legitimate claim altogether. Now let's look at contract language. In terms of regulating contracts, this can be broken up into the three branches of government, starting with legislators. Legislators create mandatory provisions in the contract. A mandatory provision might be related to providing uninsured motorists or no-fault protection, prohibited provisions, and legislators determine the process for forms approval, as well as rating approval. Legislators in many states have also passed readability standards, which says that an insurance contract must be understood by individuals with certain levels of education, such as a fourth grade level of reading. Next, courts. Courts handle contract disputes, as I've said before, which includes determining whether contracts are constitutional and interpreting any ambiguous writing in the contract. And remember, because the insurance contract is a contract of adhesion, any ambiguity in the contract is interpreted by the courts in favor of the policyholder. Next, state insurance departments. In most states, the departments of insurance approve policy forms and form changes. The NAIC, System for Electronic Rate and Forms Filing, improved the timeliness of rate and form filings and reduces the need for federal regulation. In some sense, this is similar to the National Insurance Producer Registry. It provides sort of a clearinghouse for rate filings and contract filings. This is their home page, so you can look around and see some of the things that SURF offers. The SURF system is especially advantageous to companies who operate in multiple states. This way, the company doesn't have to make multiple filings of their contract changes, but can just upload those changes into the SURF to be approved by all states in which it operates. The SURF is also used for rate filings, which again, allows insurance companies to make rate changes in the system in multiple states without having to file in each individual state. Let's look now at some other regulatory activities. 
These are mostly related to financial solvency, and I would like you to look at page 2.18 of your text and go over the financial solvency core principles to supplement what I go over here. Regulators also require statutory accounting financial statements. These are different from gap accounting. You might also refer to them as insurance statutory accounting financial statements. We'll go over these in much more detail later in the semester, but in terms of financial solvency, regulators, specifically insurance departments, pay particular attention to reinsurance, which is in Schedule F of the financial statements, reserves, which is in Schedule P of the financial statements, and the insurer's investments. All three of these can have a significant impact on an insurance company's solvency. Looking back at the chart that showed the causes of financial insolvency of an insurer, remember that reinsurance, inadequate reserves, and investments all contributed to past financial insolvencies of insurance companies. Also, regulators require a once every three to five year on-site examination for insureds that are domiciled in their state. States also provide guarantee funds. I'll define guarantee funds and then we'll look at an example with Louisiana's guarantee funds. All states have a mechanism to deal with insurance insolvencies, which are usually called guarantee funds. They usually assess insurers after insolvencies have occurred, and they might refund assessments if the fund grows too large. Assessments are based on the market share in the state. For example, if the insolvency requires an assessment for $1 million and a particular company has 25% of the market share in the state, the assessment for that company will be $250,000 or 25% of the $1 million. Let's look at Louisiana's two guarantee funds. First, the Louisiana Insurance Guarantee Association, commonly referred to as LIGA. This is only for property and liability companies, and the maximum limits are $500,000 per policy holder. So if an insurance company becomes insolvent, LIGA will cover losses for the insureds from that company up to $500,000. Next is LAHIGA, the Louisiana Life and Health Guarantee Association. This is for life insurance, health insurance, and annuities. The guarantee amount for life insurance is $300,000 per insured and for cash surrender values $100,000 per insured life. In other words, if the company goes insolvent, it will pay up to $100,000 to insureds who have not died. And in health insurance, the guarantee fund provides up to $500,000 per insured person. For annuities, the amount is $250,000 per contract owner. Last, let's talk about unofficial regulators of the insurance business. We'll start with financial rating organizations, then we'll talk about advisory organizations and professional trade associations. Financial rating organizations have a significant impact on the operations of insurance companies. The most significant of all is probably AM Best. Moody's, Standard & Poor's, Fitch Ratings, Duffin Phelps and Weiss Ratings also all provide ratings of insurance companies. They monitor insurers' solvency potential and financial strength overall. Many large insureds won't use a carrier with below a certain AM Best rating or use or lend to a company insured by a carrier below a certain AM Best rating. Usually they look for an A or better. And in fact, many insurance brokers won't work with a company that has below an A rating. And reinsurers will always look at these as well. Then advisory organizations. We've already talked at length about ISO. There's also AAIS, which provides similar rates and forms to what are provided by the Insurance Services Office. The NCCI, or National Council on Compensation Insurance, provides rates and forms and other advisory information for workers' compensation insurers in many states. Then there are professional trade associations. There are numerous professional trade associations which actually advise and lobby on behalf of insurance companies more than they regulate them. These include the Casualty Actuarial Society, 
for property and casualty actuaries. The CPCU Society is actually part of the Institute or the American Institute. They publish the textbook that you use for this course and many other courses and provide designations for many insurance professionals. Their designations are highly respected. Then there's the independent insurance agent, which is also known as the Big I, an association for independent agents, NAMIC, which is for mutual insurance companies, PCI, property and casualty insurers, the American Insurance Association, the Council of Insurance Agents and Brokers, PIA, also for independent insurance agents, NAPSLO, the National Association of Professional Surplus Lines Offices, which is for surplus lines insurers and brokers, and RIMS, the Risk Management Society, which is a worldwide association for risk managers. These associations are very important in the insurance business for providing assistance in terms of lobbying, education, and uniformity, and a general meeting place for all risk management and insurance professionals.